Hi everyone, this is your Unit 6 Energy Resources and Consumption Test Review video. So let's go ahead and start with renewable and non-renewable resources. What you need to know is the difference between these two is basically um, our accessible use of them. So with non-renewable resources, um, these are in a set amount worldwide. Once we run out, they are gone. Um, and as we use them, they are going to be consumed. So for example, when you burn coal in a coal-fired power plant, that coal is gone and is not reusable. So it's not something that can easily be replaced. Um, in the case of the fossil fuels listed here, the oil, natural gas, and coal, it's taken millions of years for those to even form to begin with. So we're definitely not going to have them replaced within our lifetime. For renewable resources, um, these are energy sources that are easily replenished. Um, they are either sources that do not get used up, for example, the sun for solar energy um, and, off, and wind energy as well, since the sun helps power uh, our wind patterns. It's not going anywhere. So since the sun will be around for a long time, we can assume that it is a renewable resource. Geothermal is the heat of the earth that will also always be there. Um, hydropower comes from river flow. Generally, rivers don't dry up most of the time. And then also things like tidal um, energy from the ocean and biomass. Now, biomass is a little tricky because if not used sustainably, meaning that we are um, using it at a rate faster than it can be re uh, replaced, this would be a problem. That would make it non-renewable at that point. So biomass would be things like wood and plant matter. As long as we allow the uh, trees and other types of plants that we are burning to grow back, um, it, basically using it sustainably, it's considered renewable. Um, and just keep in mind that these are not evenly distributed worldwide. So depending on what country you live in, what part of the world you live in, you may not always have access to certain materials and certain resources. And certain renewable energy sources may be great in some countries. For example, hydropower is very popular in Brazil because there's a lot of rivers. Um, nuclear is very popular in France. Uh, solar power is great for like the southeast of the United States, but not necessarily for the Pacific Northwest where it's very cloudy and rainy all the time. So we kind of have to adjust based on where we are located. So let's take a minute to review where fossil fuels are going to be located throughout the world. Um, I've given you some of the key producers or known reserves of these particular fuels. Um, so for example, coal is denoted with a circle on the map. Um, it is going to be found in the largest amounts in Russia, the U.S., and China. Okay, oil is going to be found in the largest reserve amounts in Iran, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, and Canada. And you can see where the squares are on the map for that one. And natural gas, denoted by a star, is going to be most commonly found in large reserves in the U.S., in Russia, and Iran. You should be familiar with these um, countries because you can be asked questions either on my test or on the AP exam asking uh, which one of the following countries has the largest known coal reserves. And they'll give you a set of them and hopefully either you know it off the top of your head or by the process of elimination you can try to figure out which one has the largest reserves. And remember reserves are the available amount of fossil fuel that we are able to extract that we um, are predicting is actually there. Moving on to energy trends, there's a few things that you should know um, about energy use as countries become more industrialized and also um, as they kind of advance through their industrialization. So first of all, as a country becomes more industrialized, they will likely switch from a biomass subsistence style energy, meaning they are using things like wood to heat their homes and to cook, uh, onto fossil fuel uh, resources or even more advanced resources like nuclear power. Um, we will see that shift as countries again become more industrialized over time. So if you take a look at the graph on the right, um, this is for the U.S. Um, and we are seeing the energy consumed, which is the lines, and the different lines are denoting different types of power. So if you notice about the time where the Industrial Revolution was taking place, you can see where 1883 is kind of boxed out. Coal has a big jump and we see wood start to decline. So we moved away from subsistence energy into more commercially produced energy. And then notice over time we start to see a little bit more um, as far as advanced energies coming around. So we see an increase in petroleum, still one of the um, most often used fuel sources worldwide. We start to see natural gas um, pick up after the 1950s. 
Um, and we see coal kind of decline a little bit with the jump in petroleum. Uh, and then notice after World War II, we start to see um, an increase in nuclear power once that technology was developed. Hydropower kind of tends to stay a little on the low end. Um, not everywhere has a river that you can put a dam on to actually produce hydroelectric power. And then wood continues to stay pretty low as well since it's no longer being really used for subsistence, meaning you don't need it for heating and cooking necessarily. Um, whereas we probably would be using electric at this point in time because the country is fully industrialized. We will also see changes in price, availability, and uh, government regulations based on uh, how fuel is being used over time as well. So for example, if gas prices increase, um, we might see people tend to buy more fuel-efficient cars. We might see a drop in the use of oil or petroleum. Um, and for example, when there's unrest in the Middle East, like we talked about in the uh, 1970s, um, we had that oil crisis and then fuel prices often rise with that unrest. All right, next we're going to go through a couple different types of fuel sources that you need to know some details on. So we're going to start with biomass. Um, like we mentioned on the last slide, this is often used as a subsistence form of energy, meaning it's used to cook or to heat a home. Um, particularly in less industrialized or less developed countries. Um, biomass would include things like wood, peat, which is kind of compacted decaying plant matter, uh, and charcoal. And charcoal, please keep in mind, is not coal, so it's not um, like the actual coal that we dig out of the ground through mining. Um, it is a wood-based product. Um, biomass is excellent for less developed countries because it's easily accessible and pretty cheap um, where those countries might not be able to afford things like coal, oil, or natural gas. Um, they can always go out and be able to cut down a tree. It's going to be something that they can get their hands on pretty easily. Um, they can also have some pollution issues though. So they may be a natural product, um, just like fossil fuels are a natural product, but burning wood is going to release particulate matter that can affect your lung health. Um, and because it is organic, it is going to release carbon compounds when burned as well. So they are definitely not pollution free. Um, remember what we talked about in class is that just because something is renewable does not make it clean and does not necessarily mean that it is entirely without pollution or environmental impact. Let's go over some details about what you need to know concerning coal. Um, you should know how we acquire coal, which is through mining. Um, and as we discussed previously in the year in class, mining definitely has some big environmental impacts from um, disturbance of land, cutting down trees, erosion due to all the loose topsoil, and then also the use of fossil fuels through the mining process itself causing pollution. You do need to know the three types of coal um, that we discussed as well by name and also by what their energy and sulfur content um, is. And sulfur content basically is referring to pollution in this case. So our uh, less compacted and heated under pressure form of coal, so kind of like a younger type coal, is going to be lignite. And this is going to be a lower heat content, lower sulfur coal. So not particularly useful for energy, um, though it would be less polluting if we did use it. Uh, bituminous would be our most commonly used coal because it's in very large supply. It has excellent heat content, so it's excellent for energy production. The problem, though, with bituminous coal is that it also is high in sulfur, which means it's very polluting. The sulfur that's released from coal uh, in the atmosphere can mix with uh, water vapor and lead to acid deposition, more commonly referred to as acid rain. And then anthracite uh, is a high heat content low sulfur, so low polluting coal. Um, it's very hard and is mostly made up of carbon and would be excellent for energy production with less of a pollution impact, but it is also available only in limited quantities. So it's not um, readily available to just burn whenever we want it. So bituminous in that case ends up being our most commonly used coal. All of these are going to be releasing particulate matter, which again can affect lung health, and then uh, carbon pollution, so carbon dioxide and other uh, greenhouse gases that can lead to climate change and warming. All right, so let's move on to reviewing crude oil. Uh, crude oil can be drilled and pumped from the ground, um, and oftentimes when crude oil is brought up from the ground, we use it uh, to convert it into other types of fuel. This fuel might be a type of fuel used in vehicles, airplanes, or other machinery. Uh, the problem, though, with these energy conversions is uh, the second law of thermodynamics, which basically means but as energy changes form, um, it can often have uh, less energy as it goes into its next form. Usually this means that as we take like a liquid form of energy like crude oil and we burn it and convert it into the type of energy that we need to power, for example, a vehicle, um, much of that energy will be released as heat. So when you burn fuel in your car, very little of it's actually going into 
the engine of the car to make it run and quite a bit is going to be released as heat which is why the hood of your car ends up heating up. So fossil fuel use is um, overall rather inefficient. Uh, we also have the problem of crude oil releasing carbon compounds when burned and those carbon compounds, things like carbon dioxide for example, can lead to increased um, global warming but then there's also particulate matter which is a lung irritant that we do not want to be exposed to on a regular basis. So burning fossil fuels in general is definitely a pollution issue. Pertaining to the use of coal and oil, uh, the process that we use with those particular fuel sources is called combustion. Um, and this is when we take a fossil fuel and we have it undergo a chemical reaction by reacting it with oxygen uh, to be able to release the energy that we need. Uh, the problem is though the byproducts of this. So when um, they're not combusted fully um, or completely, we get basically an incomplete combustion. Pollution is gonna release, including carbon dioxide, uh, water vapor, which in this case would be harmless, but other particulates as well. And so the process is going to be um, somewhat inefficient because of that, but also very polluting. So one of the ways we can try to at least increase our efficiency is by using something like cogeneration. And this is where, like, let's say you're burning coal at a power plant to produce electricity, uh, you are going to have excess heat from that process. Generally, that heat is used to boil water to create the electricity because the steam then spins a turbine and so on, which we'll discuss in more detail in just a minute. But the excess heat that's produced could be used for another purpose, so maybe heating the buildings nearby. All right, so let's move on to natural gas. Um, natural gas is the last fossil fuel that we'll be discussing, um, and natural gas is extracted through the process of fracking um, or hydraulic fracturing. And to do fracking, what we do is um, in an area that has natural gas in the rock, and the rock is often referred to as shale, um, it, it, we are going to drill into the ground to create a pathway to inject water, sand, and chemicals at very high pressure. So if you look at the picture on the right where kind of the L-shaped red line is, this would be the original drill site. And then the cracks that are kind of forming around that um, cartoon are the cracks created from the injection of the water, sand, and chemicals. So we'll shatter the rock. Um, the sand is injected to help hold open all those cracks. And in doing this, we can allow the uh, gas bubbles to rise and escape so that we can collect them. And that is the natural gas that we are then using as a fuel source. Um, two major problems, though, with fracking are um, earthquakes that can be caused by it and also the groundwater contamination potential. Because we are drilling so deep, we could very easily be drilling close by um, an aquifer and then cracking the ground open could easily allow for the chemicals injected into the ground to escape into that water source, um, which could contaminate it to a point depending on what contaminates it uh, chemical wise to where it's not safe for us to use as a drinking water source. Um, natural gas is one of the cleanest of the fossil fuels. Um, when it burns, it's going to be burning rather cleanly, um, very little particulate matter. There's less pollution, but one of the byproducts released is methane. Um, and methane does hold heat better than carbon dioxide as far as greenhouse gases go, um, but is not as long lasting. Uh, it's still definitely a concern though for global warming. Okay, we need to review how power plants work. We're gonna start with going through coal-fired power plants. We'll take a look at nuclear power plants a little bit later, um, but you should be familiar with the main equipment and the steps that take place. Um, so what we're going to do is start by allowing coal uh, to enter the power plant, and that coal is going to be burned within a furnace, and that is what we are seeing right here. Now that furnace, the whole point of burning the coal is to produce heat that is going to vaporize water. So we can see water in the pipes that are over here. This water is going to be turned into steam. And the whole point of creating steam is so that we can spin a turbine and that turbine's mechanical energy um, is going to allow for this generator over here to produce the electricity needed to be sent out into the community. Coal is not the only way that we're able to produce electricity. We often have the ability um, to have nuclear uh, power as well, which is kind of a similar facility in that it does have a turbine and a generator and we're producing steam, but we're using a different material to produce the heat needed to create the steam. So with nuclear power, um, we're gonna be using uranium-235, which is a radioactive isotope of uranium. Um, and this creates a chain reaction, as you can see on the right in the picture. Um, basically, you will have a neutron, which is the little white dot, hit an atom of uranium. 
it is going to um, rupture basically, come apart, it's going to undergo fission, and more neutrons are released and it will continue to hit the uranium, breaking it apart and breaking it apart and breaking it apart. And in doing that, it will release a lot of heat. Well, that heat is what we capture to help power um, the turbines and generators at a nuclear power plant. Um, the problem is we're dealing with a radioactive material. So as this fission takes place, radiation is released and radiation is damaging to human tissues and DNA um, and can cause mutations, can cause cancers over time as well. Um, so we have to make sure it's well made, well contained. So containment is essential at a nuclear power plant. We'll take a look at that structure in just a minute, um, but the whole point is to keep radiation inside of the reactor. Um, and then we also have to deal with the fact that there is going to be high level radioactive waste that must be disposed of. And often um, nuclear power plants are going to store these on site um, because there's really not another safe way to deal with it. Um, some types of radioactive waste are injected very deep underground, but there's also concern that that could lead to groundwater contamination or radioactivity leaks, which would not be um, safe for our health. So often they're just stored on site in dry storage casks. So let's take a look at how a nuclear nuclear power plant is going to function. It's actually very similar uh, from the steam part on to a coal-fired power plant, but if you take a look at the left, notice we have a containment structure. And this containment structure is going to be containing the actual nuclear reactor, which we're seeing in purple. That reactor is going to contain uh, the nuclear fuel rods that are going to be producing the heat to generate steam, and then also the control rods um, needed to keep the reaction from getting out of control. Uh, we will have a steam generation area where water will be brought in, allowed to be heated up with the heat from the reactor, and then that steam is going to come over here and spin a turbine. That turbine then is going to work very similarly to the coal-fired power plant. As it spins, it's going to help the generator produce electricity, and then that electricity is going to be sent out to the surrounding um, consumers of the electricity. One of the big problems though with nuclear plants um, is thermal pollution. And thermal pollution occurs when the hot water uh, from this reaction is sent to cooling towers and the goal is to cool it down, um, but it's often not going to be as exactly the same temperature as it was when it was taken from the local reservoir. So you may have warmer water emitted back into the reservoir. That warmer water can affect the behavior um, and health of fish in the area and other aquatic organisms, which is why we consider it a type of pollution, um, basically being too warm for the surrounding environment. So that is another big concern of nuclear power plants. Um, they are very clean. Other than the radioactive waste, there's no carbon emissions, there's no particulate emissions, but the thermal pollution is one of our big environmental concerns. There are a few nuclear disasters that um, have been either asked about on the test in the past or are expected to be known for future tests. Um, and these are what you're seeing on the map here. You should know their locations um, and also what happened so that you can identify them. So for example, Three Mile Island uh, in Pennsylvania occurred in the 70s and it was a partial reactor meltdown. Um, and it's thought that it did cause some incidents of cancer increases um, in later years after that. Uh, Chernobyl is one of the most famous reactor meltdowns that occurred. This was in 1986, and this occurred in the Ukraine. Um, the area is still pretty radioactive uh, where this took place. Um, and it was a human error meltdown as well. They had the um, nuclear reactor undergoing a test, and there were a couple missteps that took place leading to that meltdown. Basically, the cooling rods and the cooling fluids were not doing their job because of the uh, reactor test. And then we also have Fukushima, um, which occurred in Japan in 2011. Um, this was due to a uh, natural incident in which there was a 9.0 uh, Richter scale earthquake, and the resulting tsunami actually damaged the power plant, and four of the six reactors melted down because of that damage. The last thing that we're going to cover is our renewable sources of energy. So you should be familiar with solar energy. Um, photovoltaic cells are the cells that we use to capture the sun's energy and through a conductive material transform it into electric energy. So make sure you do know that term photovoltaic cell. They will not be referred to as solar cells on the exam or solar panels. They are called photovoltaic cells on the AP exam. Um, energy can also be stored from solar cells, which makes them particularly useful for capturing energy during the day. You can store the power um, kind of in a battery type uh, material and then release it at night as well when the sun is no longer out to allow you to generate new power. Um, there are some concerns though with photovoltaic cells is that if you do have like a solar farm, a bunch of 
panels set up in somewhere like a desert or other ecosystem that it could um, block sun from reaching the ground and affect plants growing there, negatively impacting the ecosystem. Um, another type of solar energy is passive solar energy. So photovoltaic cells would be considered active collection of solar energy. Passive energy uses clever building practices and materials in a home that are heat retaining to help take in radiation from the sun, especially during winter, hold on to that heat in those heat absorbing materials, sometimes referred to as thermal mass. As you can see in the picture on the right, and then that heat can then be released. The downside though is this heat is not storable. So once it comes into the house and is released, there's not a whole lot of control as far as storing it for later use. You should be familiar with how hydroelectric power is generated. There's a few types of hydroelectric power. Um, you can have dams, which are most commonly asked about, but there's also wave hydroelectric power. It uses something similar to a wind turbine um, to use wave and tidal energy to help collect power. Um, we're going to focus mostly on hydroelectric dams. So dams have a turbine similar to your coal and nuclear plants that are going to spin as water passes over them. So dams are not just a wall put in a river. They actually have a place where it does intake water, passes through a turbine, and then comes out the other side or downstream of the dam. Um, and that turbine, again, spins that generator to help produce the electricity that's sent out to the surrounding uh, neighborhoods and consumers. Dams, though, do have some downsides. Um, they can affect fish in the river, prevent them from being able to move from one side to the other. So we often use fish ladders to help prevent this issue. They're not 100% perfect, but it does allow fish to move from one side to the other, um, at least best that we're able to. Uh, there's no pollution issues from hydroelectric dams, but they do affect the river ecosystem because it does alter the flow of the river, which in some cases is a benefit for surrounding communities um, because rivers sometimes can be flooding issues and having a dam in place can reduce flooding as well. Um, you should know the term reservoir, which is kind of the man-made river that backs up behind a dam once a dam is built. Um, those reservoirs can be used for irrigation, they can be used um, as a surface source of drinking water once it's purified, or even for recreation as well. So dams are rarely single use, only for power. They can also help prevent flooding and give us a source of water. The next source of energy that we need to be familiar with is geothermal power. Um, geothermal power is where we use the heat from the center of the earth um, to heat water, which is then going to help produce steam, which just like our other sources of power we've discussed, um, helps spin a turbine to generate electricity in a generator. Um, these are best uh, in areas where it is already um, geologically active. So for example, plate boundaries. So Iceland is an excellent uh, example of geothermal use. They are located on a divergent plate boundary. Um, you can see the map on the right where the little red country is, that's Iceland. And because they are smack on in the middle of a divergent boundary, it means they have a lot of plate tectonic activity, makes it, making it perfect for geothermal power generation. Um, downsides of geothermal though is the plants can be very expensive and there is a possibility of having some pollution released um, due to drilling into the center of the earth in the form of hydrogen sulfide. The last source of renewable power we need to discuss um, are hydrogen fuel cells and wind energy. Um, hydrogen fuel cells use hydrogen and oxygen to react within the fuel cell, um, kind of like a battery, to create an energy source. Uh, the hope is that we might be able to apply these to cars in the future. The only byproduct from this reaction uh, within the battery is water which makes them extremely clean, but they are extraordinarily expensive to produce. And the um, problem of containing hydrogen, which can be explosive, is something that is still being worked out. So they're not used constantly in our everyday lives yet, but the hope is they will be in the future. And we also have uh, wind power you should be familiar with, which uses large turbines similar to what you see in the picture on the right to generate electricity. So wind will spin the blades of the turbine, um, which is then going to help power a generator to create electricity. Again, very similar to the turbine and generator setup we saw in our other forms of power production. The downsides of wind energy though is they are large, they can be noisy, um, and they do have the potential to kill birds and bats when the blades are spinning. So we would not want to put them um, in areas where there is a lot of uh, avian, which means bird migration, um, or near a bat population. We also would not want to find them located near a neighborhood. So really the best place to put these is in open areas. Uh, farmland is excellent for this because you can still grow crops underneath them or allow cattle to graze underneath them because they're tall enough to not cause damage, um, but keeps them away from more populated areas. All right, thank you for viewing this Unit 6 review video. I hope it helps um, and good luck on your test.